Today, we're with Nick from Amber Electric, whose company is shaking things up in the electricity retailer market by putting more control in your hands, which is very unusual for an electricity retailer. Uh, tell us, Monik. Hey, Nero, I'm great to be here. Yeah, we're a bit of a different energy retailer here at Amber Electric. We're an energy retailer. We're also a tech company, and we're committed to accelerating Australia's transition to 100% renewable energy. Please contribute. It really helps my independent, honest journalism. Do we want to bring up the elephant in the room, which is our warranties? How have you found car makers to deal with that in your sort of limited testing so far? Yeah, so we're doing a the V2G program that Amber is involved in, which is co-funded by Arena. Total total project over seven million dollars with over $3 million funding from Arena has two phases. One of the phases is smart charging phase or one-way charging. And the other phase is vehicle to grid testing. And that's a targeted rollout of 50 bi-directional charges. And as part of that, we're going to be announcing, unfortunately not right now, but soon, the specific EV brands that we'll be inviting to participate. We've tested all the popular brands. You know, the problem isn't do they discharge, it's can you give customers confidence that they discharge in a way that your warranty will be guaranteed to still exist by the car company in a sort of formal way? Yeah. No, that's a good way to put it. And and from my perspective, I know that lots and lots of EV brands are doing testing with electricity retailers like yourself and the grid providers. And yeah, they're all just being super cautious because they want to decide what kind of warranty they'll provide. Like, will it be, after this car, you can do X thousand kilowatt hours of V to G total, maybe, or maybe you can only do it, but up to the same power limit as V to L, like 3.3 or something else. Now we've seen a number of demonstrations online, some of which you've covered as well in, in other videos about popular brands of EVs working with the DC chargers that are here in Australia. And that's fantastic. I think for the trial, it's important that, you know, we want to give the customers who participate confidence that the vehicle is not only able to discharge, but doing so won't break any warranties for the EV or the battery. And we want that, you know, commitment from the brand to be quite strong. And so we've been working closely with brands to organize a trial that can keep all parties happy in that way. So we're not racing into saying just because this charge has been demonstrated to work with that EV, it's going to be available in, in the trial. We want to make sure that consumers are, are protected. The other side is, is a really big opportunity for car manufacturers, if they want to be involved, to participate in, in the testing so that they can inform themselves about battery degradation or lack thereof and what types of use might result in what types of wear and tear for the battery to then inform what they might want to do re warranties at scale um and so you know we're considering all of those different opportunities to collaborate with them on the charger side we've been testing with the star charge halo and the sig energy sig store modular storage inverter DC bidirectional charger units. And, you know, we've seen the same things that you might have seen online, which is many popular EV brands do work with the chargers in terms of their ability to discharge. But like I said, we're sort of looking for that more formal support and capability from the brands that we're going to work with in the trial before we start rolling out to those 50 sites. Is it just those two brands of bi-directional charger? I think there's InfiPower, B2 Grid Australia. Those are the other two major ones that I think are close to being certified. Yeah, they're the two we've been testing with. Our testing has included so far. Um, we're really keen to have conversations with people about other brands and, and are interested in all the different capabilities. But they're the, they're the two ones that I, I know we've been, been testing with. Um, and, um, yeah, hopefully we see more and more brands coming to market because competition in the space will be really great for price over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, like any new product, you know, once, once there's that demonstration in market of the, the benefits, then more and more people will be attracted to bring a product to market and that increases competition and drives the price down for consumers.
So who's going to win the sort of Willy Wonka golden ticket, 50 golden tickets to be in your trial, Nick? Yeah, that's that's been a common question we've been getting. So we've got a open wait list at the moment that anybody can sign up to. Maybe we could link that here. It's also on the Amber website. Yep, I'll um, put it in the video description. Yeah, great. And as part of that wait list, we're asking people about, you know, the current home equipment that they have, solar battery, as well as the brand of car that they have. And as we as we get into the specifics of the specific charger we might want to use, the networks that that specific charger has been approved on from a DNSP perspective and a sense of which EVs that we are going to support for the first part of the trial, we'll start reaching out to participants once that's all clear and inviting them to participate in the trial. We're really interested in testing a different, you know, a suite of different um, home energy setups as well as charging behaviors. So some people have got significant solar and battery and what does it look like if you're adding an EV to that mix? Are there complications with that? Um, People using a lot of energy, some people who are using their EV quite a lot for driving, does the V2G opportunity wax and wane with their availability to be at home plugged in if they're not there during the day and they don't have workplace charging? Does that, you know, diminish the opportunity for them to be discharging when the price is very high? We kind of want to get a smallest board of different use cases so that for the trial, we're not measuring one use case only and we're factoring in all of these, you know, variables. So we'll do our best based on the information in the sur- in the survey on the wait list to control for that. Um, but it's, it's really open to anyone at this point to sign up. And then as we get into the specifics, we'll be able to reach out to you and, and let you know who we're specifically looking for. And... Yeah, that's that's probably the the ask for now. I know everyone's busting to know: should I buy this car? Should I go and buy my own VDG charger, or should I wait for the the trial? And I think you know it's very very early days, and you know when we're ready to make those type of announcements, it'll be really clear and obvious. So watch this space. Okay, thanks for your time, then, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Nirav. I think you have some real life examples of a person whose EV brand we're not allowed to mention because the brand wants to remain secret so far, but they've been participating in your trial and you have some different dates and examples of price changes and what happened with their Amber account. Could you please share that? Yeah, I've got a bit of a visual here for this one. So as part of our testing, we have been installing some V2G bidirectional DC charges at different sites. And one of those sites that was working with a particular brand of car was operational for a full month of June. And so as part of a regular update we do on our blog at Amber, we wanted to share some of the results that happened because in this case in in Victoria, June had a number of days where the wholesale price for energy was very spiky. So it spiked really, really high. And that's sort of representative when you just glance at this chart about where the big dips are. Because we're, when we're thinking about V2G, from an earnings or savings perspective, there's the you know use case where I'm using energy from the car to power my home. And then if there's more energy available to be discharged above and beyond what my house needs, then I could export to the grid. And exporting to the grid during these price spikes represents a large opportunity for earning credits or offsetting your energy bill. And in this case, on the 10th, sorry, on the 11th, the 12th, and also later in June, on the 26th, there were some quite significant price spikes. So the first one, which is the first sort of dip out of the red and into the green was on the 11th of June. So until then, this customer was sort of just using energy as they normally would, powering their home, using some devices in their house. Um, regularly and they're incrementally, you know, using energy, paying the wholesale price and sort of starting to rack up their their monthly bill. But on the 11th, on the 11th of June, the wholesale spot price in Victoria jumped up as high as $16 per kilowatt hour due to a sort of combination of cold weather and some generator outages. And so the opportunity for this particular site during the trial or during this test was they began to discharge back to the grid at about five kilowatts. And so because the price was so high, 
like you sort of do the math, sixteen dollars a kilowatt hour if you're exporting five kilowatts for an hour. Um, you know, it starts to add up. Certainly, in the context of how much your bill would be for a typical month, and so this happened three times. And it turns out the first spike on the 11th of June wasn't to be the the sharpest or the longest. There was another significant high price event on the se- on the 12th of June and another one on the 26th. The ones on the 12th of June and the 26th of June were quite special in terms of the amount of time they lasted for. So not only was the price spiking up to $15 a kilowatt hour on the 12th of June and up to $20 a kilowatt hour on the 26th, but it lasted for a length of time that meant that the EV was basically discharging for multiple hours consecutively and earning credits against their account. And as you can see here, on all the other days, we went back to sort of normal programming and the customer was just paying the wholesale price and their bill was going up and up and up. And so a couple of takeaways from this, obviously, this is a great way of representing the opportunity from a earnings perspective, you know, being in approximately $300 credit for the month is great. Not every month may be like that. It's dependent on these price spikes. But something I think coming back to the battery degradation piece that's really interesting about this chart is you might think that vehicle to grid would require you to be plugging in your vehicle, you know, every day and discharging it every day. But actually, there's sort of a Pareto principle, like an 80-20 rule with 20% of the the days are going to account for like over 80% of the gains from an earnings perspective. So, It's not really about plugging in your battery and smashing it every night, discharging up to five kilowatts, you know, for six hours, seven hours, eight hours, every single night. These price spike opportunities are really, if you're focused on earning back credits and offsetting your energy bill, they're really the key times that you want to be performing this activity. The rest of the time you could be using the energy stored in your EV's battery for the vehicle to H, vehicle to home use case that we talked about earlier. And so people who might be a bit, you know, this is this is a good reminder of three nights out of a whole month might get you $300 of credit on your energy bill. And you don't have to worry about having an empty car from discharging vehicle to grid every single night. That's that's certainly not the pattern that we're observing so far in the testing. And the batteries, are, especially the modern bees with LFP batteries, they tend to be larger in capacity. So it's reasonably common to have now batteries used to be maybe 40 or 50, now 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 sometimes kilowatt hours of battery storage in the car, which is way more than anyone else, anyone has in a sort of attached to your house traditional battery. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. I think this particular EV battery is over 60 kilowatt hour size, just to give you a reference point. And yeah, compared to maybe a typical, you know, home battery, it might be over five times. Although that's changing now too. We're seeing more larger batteries come to come to market, especially with the the current subsidies. But yeah, it's a there's a huge opportunity to leverage that storage capacity in your car's battery. Thanks for liking, subscribing, and sharing my videos. It really helps me make more videos like this for you. And have a look at the suggested videos up above. I'm pretty sure you'll like those as well. Thanks, and see you later.